Hello, my friends. This is episode 61 of Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Joining me today, Greg Brew, who is a professor at Southern Methodist University, talking about the oil wars and chief business correspondent, host of Early Start on CNN. Christine Roman is talking about the markets, the economy, and everything else as it relates to coronavirus. Coming up right now on Stand Up. Well, hello, my friends. How's your anxiety? Is it peaking? If it is, that means, guess what? You are normal. What are your favorite coping mechanisms? How are you dealing? The U.S. now has over 800 confirmed cases of coronavirus, 27 deaths. Nursing homes are barring family and friends. The president has pitched a tax cut. That should really help out. Uh, New York has created a containment zone across the river from where I live in New Rochelle. Across Europe, there is no consistency in containment tactics. Coachella organizers are in talks to postpone that major music festival. And the FDA has halted overseas inspections of drugs and devices. So much information coming out minute by minute, hour by hour. And I know that it is overwhelming. Today, I've got two great guests that are going to talk about how it is affecting the economy with Christine Romans and Greg Brew of Southern Methodist University. He's an expert on the history of energy. The oil wars are now playing out as a result, to some extent, of the pandemic. China versus the Saudis and the U.S. Really fascinating, important information coming up with my conversation with him. But I want to thank all of you who are supporting this podcast with subscriptions on Patreon. And I've said in the last couple episodes, I'm not taking advertising yet. But if you are a patron of mine, I will plug whatever cause, organization, nonprofit, or your company. And I want to thank you for all of you who are taking advantage of that. So real quick, before I get to my first guest, Eric Wood wanted to give a shout out to a specific podcast called Crosstown with Pat Kiernan. And he said, listen to the episode about Cheryl Willis's personal fight to right the wrongs of slavery. There you go, Eric. I plugged that podcast for you. Also, Dan Marino says, as a patron, I'd like to use my poll to request you to plug the importance of hand washing 24-7, 365, not just during Corona fear. Uh, patron Chris Schmidt says, hey, Pete, I've been listening to you since way back when you were on the POTUS channel on Sirius XM, the run-up to 2008 election. So glad to be able to keep listening to you throughout the podcast. One of my recent podcasts, you said you could plug items from listeners. I've got one for you. My wife is a veteran of the Iraq war and has worked uh, in various veteran focused positions for over a decade. She currently works for a veteran run coffee roaster that employs other veterans. Please tell your listeners to support veteranroasters.com veteranroasters.com. There you go, Chris. And finally, James Grote is a longtime listener and supporter on Patreon. He has his own app, a game, and you're going to want this game since we're all going to be self corn. Teening. It's an iOS game called Scribble Ball. Billiards with paint for iPhone and iPad. Go download, go buy Scribble Ball. That is another patron. All right. It's an awesome community of listeners here supporting one another. That's what we need to do right now more than any time probably in our lifetimes is to support each other. You know, I was listening to this podcast hosted by Harry Littman called The Feds, and I think that he opens his show in an interesting and dramatic way. And frankly, I really like the music. So let me have him describe the week so far, because I think he does such a great job on his podcast, Talking Feds. This is the week in which it feels like the coronavirus went from a whisper to a scream. Suddenly it hit home. Trips got canceled. People worked from home. Communities declared states of emergency. Drugstores ran out of masks and sanitizer. Worldwide cases approached 100,000. And of course, American people died, 14 and counting. We began to grapple with the tangible details of prospects that seemed the stuff of science fiction, like quarantines, which already affect thousands of New Yorkers, and school closures, which now affect all of Italy and Iran. Uncertainty was and is rife, with no apparent way of quantifying the likely intensity and duration of the virus, for which there'll be no available vaccine for at least a year. 
and the Trump administration's propensity to lie and spin, and the president's own ignorance in his briefing of the American people, came to appear pernicious and dangerous. That's Harry Lippman on Talking Feds, and uh, I just really like that music and the way that he delivered that. And do you think President Trump has been pernicious and dangerous? Well, here he is earlier. I think this is from Tuesday. It might have been Wednesday night. The president saying crazy, crazy shit. And we're doing a great job with it, and it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. We want to protect our shipping industry, our cruise uh, industry, cruise ships. Uh, we want to protect our airline industry. Very important. Uh, but everybody has to be vigilant and has to be careful. But be calm. It's really working out, and a lot of good things are going to happen. Uh, the consumer is ready. The consumer is so powerful in our country with what we've done with tax cuts and regulation cuts and all of those things. The consumer has never been in a better position than they are right now. So a lot of good things are going to happen. Thank you very much. Well, don't you feel better? A lot of good things. A lot of good things are happening. We're doing a good job. Things are working out. (laughs) Does it does it feel like things are working out? Does it feel like they're doing a good job? Or we're, I mean, wow. Oh, boy. He is really concerned, obviously, on the economy and how that's going to affect him. And so I don't know what else to say about the president. I really try to ignore him as much as I can, not play him, not retweet him, but I had to play that one for you. Okay, coming up, I will play a little bit of my conversation with one of my biggest supporters on Patreon, who is also emergency room doctor in Texas. He'll give a little bit of his take uh, how that's going in his emergency room. Tom Bossert, the president's former home- Homeland Security Advisor, told NBC News today, Tuesday, that uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak, we are 10 days from the hospitals getting creamed. In an op-ed published by the Washington Post on Monday, Tom Bossert also stated, officials must trigger and aggressive interventions, later adding aggressive interventions put off and ease the peak burden on hospitals and other health care infrastructure. That is the president's former Homeland Security Advisor, and that's why he is a former Homeland Security Advisor. Well, we'll hear from ER doctor and friend of mine, patron supporter, whose name I'm not going to share, but uh, you'll hear his comments later. I'll also give shout outs to the first five people who signed up for Patreon subscriptions back in early November. And coming up, my conversation with CNN's chief business correspondent, Christine Romans, on all things regarding the economy and different industries affected by coronavirus pandemic. That's coming up. But Right now, my first guest is Greg Brew. He is a professor, a historian, an expert on the history of oil and energy at Southern Methodist University. He is on Twitter at GBrew24. Please follow him. You will not regret it. Thousands of people followed him after tweets that he sent about the, quote, oil wars over the weekend. This is such an important interview and information, and I hope that you will follow him to thank him at GBrew24. Here's my conversation with Professor Greg Brew. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I loved your tweet, Storm. I learned a lot. You're good at explaining things, so glad to have you here. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for having me on. How long have you been studying oil markets? I've been studying oil markets for about seven years now. Uh, I started when I was in grad school in Washington, D.C., and I've been working on the markets since then. I live in uh, Dallas, Texas now, uh, which is a good place to be if you're watching the oil industry. (laughs) A lot of oil companies are based out of here. So, uh, yeah, so it's been about seven years for me. I also work, uh, I'm a historian by training. So I work on the history of oil as well as the history of U.S. foreign relations in the Middle East, uh, specifically with Iran. Yeah, I'm really fascinated by all of your work on this, uh, and I want to talk to you about that as well. But sure. just real quick, I mean, how did you? How did you? I guess this is a personal question, but why did you get interested <laughs> in energy or oil markets? You know, at college age, what was what? What draw you to? Uh, it, you it's to a it? funny. Yeah, it is kind of a funny question. I suppose just curiosity. Uh, I had taken some classes when I was in college. Um, that sort of touched on oil's importance in the history of U.S. foreign relations. You know, I took a few classes on the Middle East, learned about uh, the Cold War, learned about the Suez Crisis and the Persian Gulf War. And oil, it all, you know, it always seemed to be important, but I, I had trouble understanding how the industry worked, you know, from the point of view yeah. of just, just taking courses uh, that focus mostly on foreign policy. So when I was in grad school, I started studying 
oil history, you know, the history of the oil industry. I read Daniel Jurgen's The Prize, which is the book that kind of everybody reads on the subject. And I got so fascinated, I started going back and reading older books, really diving into the literature. And I even had the chance to do research at um, oil company archives and read uh, you know, oil company executives' memos to one another, um, which got me even wow. more interested. Yeah. So, so I, really, I, I really got interested in oil's history. And then at the same time, you know, I felt, well, it would also be good to understand how the industry works today. You know, it's a sure. it's a complex industry that's changed a lot over the last uh, few decades. So uh, while I was doing my research, while I was working on my PhD dissertation, I started writing and researching contemporary issues of energy and geopolitics, and, and got even more interested. Uh, well, I, I'm so glad I asked you because that answer is a thorough way of saying you are an expert on this <laughs> because you you understand the history of it as well as the current state, the economics of it, all of it. So let's let's dive in sure. because this is such an important issue right now. We have an oil price war, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> is, am, is it right? Is that what's yeah. going on? And uh, yeah. ex, it, w what happened? You had an amazing tweet storm oh, yeah. that went super viral. You got thousands oh, of new Twitter followers yeah. simply by being an expert <laughs> on an issue. How about that? You weren't showing pictures of your ass. You're an expert <laughs> of an issue. On In this case, it's so vitally important. And people followed you as a result. It's good Twitter uh, habits, I would say. So what is an oil price war? What's going on? Okay. So to give uh, a, a shortest answer I can think of, for the last couple of years, uh, Saudi Arabia, which kind of leads OPEC, it's sort of the de facto leader of OPEC. It's the biggest producer right. in OPEC. Uh, it has the most what's known as spare capacity. So it can increase production very rapidly if it needs to. So Saudi Arabia sort of leads OPEC. And for the last couple of years, Saudi has worked with Russia to implement cuts to production. So organizing cuts across the board, uh, not just for Saudi and Russia, but for all OPEC members. And the reason they've been doing that is U.S. shale. The increase in U.S. domestic production has placed pressure on oil prices, downward pressure, because now there's this oversupply. You've got OPEC producing, you've got the U.S. producing. So Saudi and Russia have conspired over the last couple of years to cut production to try to keep prices high. And in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of concern about oil demand in 2020 because of the coronavirus, the impact that the coronavirus is having on international markets, on Chinese oil demand. So OPEC and Russia were going to meet on March 5th in Vienna to talk about more cuts, you know, to, to try to do something to keep the price of oil high. But Russia said no. Russia wasn't having it. They said no to the idea of more cuts, or specifically they said no to the Saudi requests for more cuts. Russia walked away from the meeting saying that, you know, we're not going to cut production anymore. We're going to pump more oil and try to take back some market share. And the Saudi response to that was, well, we're going to produce even more. <laughs> we're going to push you out of the market. We're going to try to push the U.S. shale producers out of the market. And what we now have is the Saudis, the Russians are promising to produce as much as they possibly can. Markets on Monday opened to this news with prices just falling, because now what we're going to look at is uh, an even more serious oil, uh, oil oversupply on the market, a supply shock. At the same time, you have the coronavirus demand shock. So demand is falling even as supply is going yeah. to vastly increase. So that's why that's why we saw markets open on such a crushing uh, uh, crash on Monday. Prices collapsed by about 30 percent on Monday, which, of course, drove down the rest of the stock market. All right, let me just take a moment here to play some music to calm everybody down. My <laughs> panic attack is in full effect. Economically, you write, you tweeted, and everybody's got to follow Greg at GBrew24. Economically, this could get very bad for Texas and North Dakota, where the oil and gas industry carries a lot of weight. Most companies are hedged, so even sweeping bankruptcies or defaults might not produce economic impacts. A shale bubble might not impact the broader U.S. economy. This shale you talk about, this is a new discovery and a new technological way to get that oil out. That's what you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. A lot of Americans understand that. Mm -hmm. But specifically, when you say this could get very bad for Texas and North Dakota, what do you mean? Who are we talking about? OK, so oil and gas has always been very important to the Texas economy going back to the beginning of the 20th century. So 
you know, generally speaking, in the past, when we've seen a drop in the price of oil, that's usually been a good thing for American consumers. It means gas prices fall. It means energy prices fall. That's a win for most states. Generally speaking, it's been a loss for Texas because Texas is where most American oil companies are based. So when the prices fall, you see companies slash spending, you see companies lay off workers. So Texas tends to suffer when the price of oil falls. It's going to suffer even more now because of what's been known as the shale revolution, the fracking boom. You've seen a massive increase in domestic uh, U.S. domestic oil production over the last uh, you know four or five years. So the size of the energy sector has grown, particularly in Texas. So this fall in prices is going to impact Texas in a pretty profound way. It will depend on how long prices stay low. You know, if this is a temporary crash, if uh, if some agreement is made uh, with OPEC or with Russia and prices come back up, the pain might not be so severe. But the longer prices stay low, the worse it is for Texas. Now, I mentioned North Dakota because North Dakota has become a pretty important energy spot over the last couple of years because, again, of this shale revolution. You have the Bakken shale field up in North Dakota. If you take a look at uh, satellite photos of the United States at night, you can see this mass of light out of western North Dakota. This what seems to be a new city has appeared in western North Dakota. And that's just the shale industry. That's just the oil industry. So a loss of oil price, of uh, a crashing oil price is going to really seriously impact North Dakota. I would also say Alaska, New Mexico, our neighbor to the north, Canada, might see some pretty uh, significant uh, economic impacts uh -oh. as a result of this oil price crash because oil and gas is very important to the Canadian economy. So, you know, it's a little bit too early to gauge the overall economic impact of this price crash. What I would say is that it's very closely linked to the coronavirus, which, of course, we've seen is having a broader economic impact. So these two issues are pretty closely linked. Meaning if if the panic and the hysteria and the virus itself uh, itself starts to subside and slow down, then you could see the oil markets react to that because of what they expect demand will be that will uh, be ready to get back in our cars and go back to work, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. So this this price okay. war, as I mentioned before, this Saudi Russia price war is, you know, comes out of a, ver a variety of factors, some of which are domestic and political, some of which are just you know, the nature of Saudi-Russian relations. The Saudis and the Russians don't exactly like each other. They've been working closely together, but there are a lot of issues there. So the price war is partially the result of that, but it's also a response to the demand shock of the coronavirus. So exactly as you just said, if markets start to see a recovery from the disease outbreak, if we start to see markets relax a little bit, if we start to see this sense of concern, even of panic start to subside, there's a chance that oil prices might start to lift. But that, again, would depend on what the Saudis and the Russians, the result of their price war, how long it lasts, how long they choose to pump at will and produce as much as they possibly can. So the two are quite closely linked. Uh, you do have a couple little comments on the politics of this. You quoted the president's tweet. A lot of people talking about the president tweeting yesterday. Uh, this is good for the consumer. Gasoline prices are coming down. Uh, your reaction to the president or anybody looking at this through a political lens, who does this kind of help? Who does it hurt? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. And the president, I've been following uh, the president's rhetoric on oil for quite a while now, and he has some interesting views <laughs> on oil, to say the least. But uh, yeah. generally speaking, what uh, President Trump usually likes to draw attention to is precisely what you mentioned, the price of gasoline. I often think that Donald Trump's political worldview was shaped by the experience of the 1980s, the 1990s, a period where gasoline prices were you know, rising and falling with the whims of global geopolitics. You know, if there was a war in the Middle East, gas prices would go up. If there was a period of calm, if there was a period of you know, stability, gas prices would go down. So I think the president thinks in those terms. So from his perspective, falling oil prices means lower gas prices. That's a good thing for the American consumer. He might not be thinking about the state of energy companies. He might not be thinking about the state of Texas and the thousands of people who work in the energy industry in Texas, what's going to happen to them when this price, uh, as a result of this price crash. Uh, so domestic politics is an interesting angle here. I would say that 
it's still, like I mentioned, it's still a little early to know what the broader economic impact of this is going to be. It's also a little hard to separate the panic on the markets from the coronavirus with the shock of this oil price crash. The two are linked. Um, I would argue that the coronavirus is going to have a broader impact um, as opposed to the price of uh, oil, which tends to affect only certain sectors. Um, but the president, I think, needs to bear in mind that this could have potentially wide ranging effects on the 2020 presidential election. It might anger a lot of people, especially here in Texas, that the president doesn't seem too concerned about the state of their industry or the state of their economy. So that could have uh, that could have repercussions down the road. All right. So you are a historian and you've got a book uh, in manuscript phase, I guess, called Petroleum in Progress, Global Oil, Local Development and the American Encounter with Iran, which I'd really love to talk with sure. you about at length. Uh, and maybe at another time, I know we only have a couple more minutes here. So I just wanted to ask you, just generally speaking, have we seen anything similar to what you refer to now as an oil war in, in, in the past? Because this is a, a very original situation what with the, the virus and, and what a lot of people are calling a pandemic. But what's not, I guess, as unique is that, you know, new deposits of oil and energy changes are, are discovered in different ways throughout the history of time. And so the United States shale discovery, the, the, the hydrofracking, uh, the fracking, which mm -hmm. we can talk about, which obviously is controversial, has created uh, a, a huge market for America. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this earlier. When in history have we seen anything like this at all and what usually happens? So the best Not to mention the players fighting this way, yeah. I guess that is that unique. The Russia Saudi yeah. dispute. Yeah. So the Russian Saudi alignment uh, is a new development. It only it only appeared in the last few years. Um when shale first kind of emerged as a force on the global um, global oil market, uh, the initial Saudi reaction was to essentially do what they're doing now. They started in about 2014, 2015, they started pumping more oil under the assumption that they could push down prices and drive U.S. shale out of business. They thought, well, you know, we're Saudi Arabia, we can produce a large amount of very cheap oil, U.S. shale is more expensive, they're perhaps less organized, they haven't had time to you know, carve out their market share, we can push them out of business. Right. So they tried to do that in right. 2014, 2015. It didn't work. Uh, shale proved to be much more resilient. American companies proved to be very effective at cutting costs, at uh, automating a lot of their uh, operations. They consolidated. Uh, so by 2016, 2017, Saudi Arabia gave up on that uh, overproduction strategy and chose production cuts. The other moment in oil's history that I would point to uh, is what is sometimes known as the oil countershock of 1985-1986. Many people are familiar with the oil shocks of the 1970s. You know, this is when OPEC first appeared on the global scene. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's when they started, you know, uh, driving up the price of oil. Uh, so that happened in the 1970s. What happened in the 1980s was in response to the rise of OPEC, the United States or energy companies started to turn to non-OPEC sources. This is when we see Alaska becoming an important source of oil, Canada, uh, the Soviet Union, and then, of course, later Russia becomes a major, uh, an, even, an even greater provider of oil during this period. The North Sea, just outside of Scotland, starts to produce in large quantities. So in 1985-86, Saudi Arabia looks around and they see competition. <laughs> they see new sources that are competing with them. Right. And they do what they've done now, which is increase production, flood the market with cheap Saudi crude. And the impact on the domestic uh, U.S. domestic oil industry as the result of this was devastating. You talk to any oil executive over the age of 60, you ask him or her about the 1986 oil price shock, and they'll tell you some pretty gnarly stories. The, dev the uh, impact of the U.S. economy or the U.S. energy economy was pretty significant. So we have seen this kind of behavior before. Never, I would agree, never in this particular context. Uh, as you mentioned, this uh, energy industry is always changing. There's always new developments. There's always new technologies. The other big issue that I would point to going into 2020, there was concern about future oil demand. You know, how long is the global economy going to need oil? Yeah, that's been and a concern much, for... Yeah. yeah, and how much are they going to need? Not just because of coronavirus, but because of the challenges of climate change. Right. Are fossil fuels going to remain a viable, profitable 
source of energy. And you've seen growing concerns, growing skepticisms, not just about U.S. shale, which is new, relatively expensive, uh, occasionally quite difficult to produce, and has uh, attracted a lot of negative attention for potential environmental impacts, particularly yeah, from- extremely controversial. Yeah, very controversial. Yeah. You know, uh, the biggest new issue is methane. Leaks, leaks of methane from, yeah, from yeah, fracking wells. It could be uh, the worst, the single largest uh, uh, contributor to global emissions uh, recently. So that's another issue that's uh, impacting this price war. Well, I guess the question might be, uh, if the future question is, who has the most lithium battery raw materials in their countries. I read this morning it was China in the U or rather Chile in the U S Chile. I don't know if that's yeah. Right, but... Lithium, <laughs> right. The, twi- yeah, the if, future is lithium. If the 20th century was the century of oil. The 21st century could very well be the century of lithium. Is that right? I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. That's something else I've been looking at. Uh, yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about everything that you're looking at, including your article back in November about the, uh, sure. the overthrow of the, the, the shop. I'm going to let you go because you've given me so much of your time. But the only thing that I'm happy about after our conversation, Greg, is how excited I am to find and discover your work and your ability, by the way, great on Twitter. But you never know if somebody's going to be as good of a, you know, <laughs> a guest on the on the air, on the radio, on a podcast like this as they are on Twitter. You have not disappointed. <laughs> explained it so well. And I really look forward to leaning on you and relying on you for uh, your your voice and expertise in the future. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Peter. You have a great one. And yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm always happy to chat. Will do. All right, great. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right, well, after I talked with Greg and press stop, we kept talking and I asked him about how he thought his tweets went viral over the weekend. And I also asked him about how the cancellation of South by Southwest affected Austin, Texas, where his wife lives and he lives part time. And he had really thoughtful answers to both those questions. So I asked him if I could hit record again. So here's just a couple more minutes with Greg Brew and his answers to those questions. You basically had a, a thread of tweets go absolutely viral, and you're telling me you were just uh, hanging out in line for, what were you getting, a drink? Yeah, so I was in Austin, Texas. I live in Dallas, but my wife lives in Austin, Texas, so I was here for the okay. weekend. And I had some, I was standing in line at the South Congress Hotel waiting to get a margarita. They do fantis, fantastic hibiscus margaritas, by the way. Anyone, right, anyone ever nice. comes to Austin. Uh, Making me thirsty. Recommend, yeah, you, recommend it highly. And I was just standing in line, and I thought, you know, there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Maybe I write a little thread while I'm waiting for my drink and try to explain it to some of my followers who aren't working in the oil industry. And I wrote the thread and I went back up. Uh, my wife's uh, mom was in town. So we were all hanging out in her hotel room and I uh, don't give it another thought. And then I look back on Twitter six hours later. Oh, all right. A couple of likes, a couple of retweets. The next morning, you know, it's thousands of likes, thousands of retweets. I've officially gone viral, as they say, and it had never happened mm-hmm. before. <laughs> and so it just, I guess it just, uh, it goes to show yeah, but, how unexpected these things could be. Yeah. But I will say this, I've had, I've had tweets, you know, get a lot of attention, but you got thousands of followers as well. That yeah. rarely happens. And I think that that's really important and good because you're such a, you're an expert and people <laughs> need to be listening. To, that's why I do this show to talk to experts and elevate the voices of policy experts like yourself. So there's a whole thousands of new people following you as well, right? Well, yeah, I just hope I don't disappoint them. <laughs> I got to keep the content coming and I got to keep, you know, got to keep their interest. But it was, it was very gratifying uh, to see people uh, read my work and become very interested and then respond by saying, you know, you've really helped me understand this. You've really helped me understand what's happening right now. And I also got to say, you know, I got lucky because I wrote that thread on Saturday uh, predicting what might happen on Monday, and then exactly what I wrote happened on Monday, <laughs> which of course in terms cost, of the- cost a lot of people <laughs> a lot of money. But yeah. uh, so, so you know, silver lining, All I right, suppose. Re- real quick, you said it uh, cost people a lot of money. Can you just, uh, do you have any opinion that you would share on the record here? I know you're not necessarily an economist, specifically of Austin, but you said your wife lives in Austin, you live in Dallas, which must be an interesting relationship. Uh, but, but the what happened with South by Southwest canceling to the Austin economy? Any any thoughts or opinion on that? Well, I am, like, you know, I am a bit of an honorary Austinite. I spend a lot of time down here. Uh, sure. When you're an academic, you kind of, you know, you go where the work is. So I work up in Dallas, but my my wife loves it down here in Austin. So I come down here as often yeah. as I can. Yeah, I here think it's awesome. With, with South by Southwest, I think they were going into it. There were a lot of concerns about the coronavirus. There were a lot of concerns about what might happen in the city of Austin, which is a fairly small city. 
compared compared to cities like Dallas or Houston, it's it's pretty small. What might happen with thousands of people coming in, not only domestically but internationally? And I think you know, Mayor Adler, Mayor Steve Adler, decided that that was too much of a public health risk, and he opted to you know cancel the festival. The broader economic impact from this to the city of Austin could be pretty bad, could be pretty uh, severe. Sure, I would partic- yeah. I would particularly point to. A lot of local musicians, Austin has a thriving local music, local art scene, and a lot of local musicians depend on festivals like South by to, you know, make it another year. So this could be particularly bad for them. Um, As for the broader city, you know, we've got a lot of uh, the city's been growing pretty rapidly. A lot of companies have been coming down here. A lot of companies have been starting down here. Uh, we're well, in the University midst of, of Texas a local is there, yeah. but you know, you think about, uh, I think Ohio state just closed. If yeah. you sell pizza or anything else in Columbus, Ohio, much yeah. less of a, if, a, if a college town closes its college and sends everybody home. Yeah. I don't know what Austin's going to do on that front. So we'll, we'll just yeah. have to wait and see, but yeah, it was, I think it was disappointing to a lot of people that South by Southwest was canceled, but I think, of course. I think for the city, it, it just, uh, it posed too much of a health risk. Yeah, fair enough. That's got to be a tough political decision. Yeah. Greg, thanks again, man. I really appreciate no it. No problem. Thanks so much, Peter. Had a great time talking to you. Feel free to reach out in the future. Will do. How about that guy, Greg Brew? Really good at communicating, huh? Not only good on Twitter at GBrew24, but an excellent communicator. I'm very glad to have had him on the show. Look forward to talking to him again. Lots to discuss when it comes to the oil markets. And uh, yeah, that guy was awesome. Also, today when I was putting together the podcast, I got a text from Patreon supporter and friend of the show, Dustin Barnett, who mentioned as a result of the plugs that I gave him for being a patron. He has had a few inquiries, and that's really exciting. So I want to just take a moment to, again, plug his company. It's called Triskeel Promo. Triskeel is T-R-I-S-K-E-L-E promo.com. And basically, his company puts your logo on cool brand name products like Patagonia, Lululemon, North Face, etc., as well as like headphones and speakers from JBL or Beats and suitcases and luggage. So Dustin, I've talked to a bunch of times. He's been a longtime listener and supporter. He's a really cool guy. He's had a fascinating and not always easy life like none of us have, but he told me all about it. He started his own company. He's married. He's a young guy in California trying to make a go of it. I'd love to see you support him. So if you're thinking about printing logos on different products, your company logo or whatever you want to promote, check out triskeelpromo.com. Now let's get to my second guest of today's episode. It is Christine Romans. She joined me almost every week at SiriusXM. A lot of you have been wondering where she is. Well, guess what? She's right here today on the Stand Up Podcast. She's back. Hi, Christine Romans. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Pete. Great to be here. Okay, so first of all, I'm looking at your Twitter timeline, and uh, your fourth grader says now is the time to buy stocks. <laughs> no, I couldn't believe it. Well, no, he came home from school, and he said, Mom, what's going on with the stock market? What's going on with the stock market? And I said, uh, well, there's this coronavirus thing. We don't know what's going to do to the economy. And so the stock market took a pretty big tumble. And he said, well, is that bad for us? And I said, well, it's the long, we're taking the long view. I'm not worried about it. You shouldn't worry about it either. And he said, well, but Mom, if stocks fell, doesn't that mean you can buy more of them? <laughs> And I said, exactly. Do you have any money, kid? And he doesn't have any money, so it doesn't do us any good. But <laughs> Well, looks like he's taking mom's books off the uh, bookshelves <laughs> uh, that she's written and reading them. Okay, so lots of different ways and important ways to look at what is happening. I appreciate that we have your analysis because you're looking at it in, from so many different points of view, macro, global, domestic, and so on. But I'm seeing a lot of economic indicators and pronunciations, pronunciations, I don't know, of uh, recession. Quarter one, quarter two look to be a bit of a wash for this year, 2020. What is your macro analysis for the country? Well, the first quarter is behind us. The second quarter, you know, Deutsche Bank this weekend said could see a contraction, meaning the economy will shrink 0.6 percent. But a lot of the economists um, have been expecting that things bounce back into the end of the year. The big question is, what does the second quarter and the really the summertime, what does that look like? How long does this coronavirus last? When does it 
I guess, burn itself out? And do we have a vaccine in time to, you know, prevent it for people who want the vaccine next year if it should come back? So that's um, that's the big uncertainty here. And that's why the stock market has been so uh, wigged out, because you just don't have any clarity on that yet. Now, it's not like the financial crisis of 2008 when we thought we couldn't use an ATM machine, that this financial system would right. break. We know this is going to be over eventually. We just don't know what it's going to look like between now and then. What are you uh, most interested in? Which industries are you watching and most interested in? Travel tourism seems to be the kind of most obvious one, but the ripple effect all the way down, especially to people like me and lots of other people listening in the gig economy. Yeah. What are your uh, observations about which jobs, which industries are really going to take at least a definite temporary So hit? the two that I'm watching right now are leisure and hospitality and the airlines. So Delta Airlines withdrew its guidance for the year. It's going to be canceling some flights. United has said that it is expanding, um, you know, how how long you have to buy a ticket and can just, you know, refund it or change your, you know, with no fees. They're doing everything they can to try to make sure that um, you can change your travel so you keep buying your tickets. But I'm sure you've seen on social media these pictures of people getting on a flight and there's five people on the plane and all these empty seats. You know, so that's the real problem. You know, if people in the airline industry tell me, Pete, it's worse or as bad as it was after 9-11. Um, but that was something, after 9-11, that was something that went all the way until 2004, you saw plane travel down. No one expects that to happen in this case. It will bounce back, but again, we don't know when, and for the time being, airlines are really having to, to change how they do business so that they can, uh, they can cut, cut through it. Leisure and hospitality, I was really interested that the president this week finally said he would consider not only a payroll tax holiday, but maybe paying people to stay home in some of these jobs where you don't have guaranteed sick leave. We do not have federal uh, guaranteed sick leave in the United States. And so some companies have been coming out and saying, no, no, we're going to pay people to stay home if they're sick. We promise we don't want we don't want people in customer facing jobs out there spreading, potentially spreading the virus or getting the virus because they're living paycheck to paycheck and they can't afford to stay home. Um, but you'd like to right. see the federal government take some leadership role on that. The president has hinted that he will. We'll see what the final stimulus uh, ideas he comes up with. Yeah. Interesting. You had a tweet about uh, how g good the economy was going and. How the Trump administration was bragging about that. And now we're at a point where suddenly later, here it is, just a few months ago, the president called this the greatest economy in history. Today, the White House is pitching emergency stimulus. My, how fortunes have changed. They really have. And, you know, this is why when the president was cheerleading the economy and taking credit for it and taking credit for the stock market, it made so many of us who have covered markets in the economy for years uncomfortable. And mostly because traditional presidencies have not done that, but also because this thing, we all know this thing can turn on a dime. I mean, the economy was strong right before 2008, before it wasn't. You know, when the, when the sub, how many times did I hear from Washington, the subprime, you know, sector was not going to feed into the regular uh, real estate market or to the economy. Right. They were just wrong. Right. So you really run the risk of cheerleading and sending this over optimistic message and, and really uh, raising hopes for investors. And it turns out not to be true. But, you know, the president is supposed to be confident. You're not supposed to get up there and say, oh, this this is terrible. What was me? You know, you're supposed to project confidence, but gravitas, leadership and problem solving. The president is known for his riffing. And that riffing was starting to really undermine, I think, um, uh, market participants. And they've told me that. I mean, Greg Valier, uh, an economist who we have on my show a lot, said we need a wartime president, someone who says right. we will get through this by the end of the summer. Things are going to come back. But we need a wartime president who can say there might be sacrifice for some of you. Prayer is in order. Stay calm. Right, right. I mean, an Oval Office speech back in January just preparing the country for uh, this outcome so we don't panic is one thing I was thinking about might help. But, you know, nobody, a lot of, of us don't trust the president, especially when he's talking about numbers, statistics or science. Uh, so we're looking to state and local leaders and hoping that the federal government will be able to finance a lot of their responses, I feel like, is is a lot of what we should and can be expecting from the federal government because this virus breaks out in different pockets and so on. What else, uh, Christine, in terms of other industries or any, anything else that you're watching in terms of other industries that the ripple effect here has in terms of restaurants or, you know, as a comedian, I'm like, you know, a lot of comedians are like, oh, all my gigs are getting canceled. You know, audiences and rooms, right. live theater performances, the festival South by Southwest, of course, getting canceled. That hammers the economy of Austin and uh, that ripple effect goes right down. 
down yeah. the line. Any, anywhere else or anything well, else? Well, and this is an interesting because it's an economy I don't really know how to measure, but I've been watching all these universities close and send kids home and parents scrambling ah. to get their kids from campuses. I think Ohio State has 66,000 kids who are going to be uh, young men and women who are going to be doing telelearning. They're not going to be actually in the classroom. And I'm just wondering what is the economy of getting that all up and running? Um, have we tested this? Do we know it works? I just don't want American students to lose any important learning time, especially if you are paying twenty some thousand dollars a year for or for in state tuition at a at a big school, and now you're not learning, right? So how is the uh, how is the academic system going to work? You know, we have a case in my school district, and they are still going to school. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a. It's a, they won't say who it is. It's, a, it's an adult and it's somebody who works in the school, schools. Mm. Uh, so the district is still going, but you know, they canceled the Six Flags trip for the eighth graders. They canceled the High Note Music Festival, you know, the, 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 the yearly spring band, con you know, band conferences where we rent buses, they stay in a hotel room, they go and, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate the right. kids are missing that experience. That's one thing. But to miss actual education time is something I worry about. Yeah, really good point. What about uh, this? Uh, I'm going to talk uh, with another guest about this later. But the, the the oil markets, the war between the Saudis and, and Russia doesn't really have anything to do with the virus spreading. It would seem maybe there's a connection I'm, not, uh, I'm missing. But are you following that at all? Because that seems like some pretty bad timing to layer on top of what else is happening with the pandemic. Spreading. It's really nutty. And I think that was the big catalyst yesterday. We've had two and a half weeks of just dire feelings in the stock market. And then yesterday, that crash in oil prices really took it to a new level. Look, and it was a crash. I'm very careful about words, Pete, like panic and plunge and crash, because there are right. very specific Good. parameters for using words like that, that I have been taught over the mm -hmm. years. And sometimes people throw those words around and it's not what they mean. Yesterday was a crash in the oil market. And we haven't seen something like that since 1991 when the US stormed into Kuwait and didn't have any didn't have any uh, uh, resistance and oil prices tanked because it was like suddenly like oh my gosh we're going to have the oil the market you know it's, it's it's a long story but basically it was a war the last time you had prices move like that. So I think that's pretty important for context. It's a fight for market share between basically the Russians and the Saudis. The U.S. is in an interesting position because when we were an oil consumer, this country on balance, when you had a crash in oil prices, that was good for America. That meant we could buy oil cheaply and it cost us less to power America's factories and engines. But now we're a net producer of oil, in particular this shale oil, which is expensive to produce. Now all of a sudden, a collapse in oil prices isn't good for us. It means those shale producers aren't going to get as much money for a barrel of oil, and it means there will be bankruptcies and thousands of jobs lost. So it's a complicated story between Russia and Saudi Arabia with implications for consumers in the U.S. who will have cheaper gas prices, but it's negative for the U.S. economy. Yeah, I was uh, thinking that specifically, you know, the president sharing the lower gas prices, trying to put a positive spin on this. But you just mentioned America's production of oil because of shale. So you're looking at jobs in North Dakota and Texas, I think, is my understanding, where those yeah. economies are going to get hit like right yeah. away. I'm, I'm a little worried about that. So that could be a, an impact on, on real voters, on real consumers who are going to see that crash in oil prices. And it's going to be a problem for U.S. Um, US producers. So on the one hand, it's a great thing that, that we have energy independence. I mean, we've been looking for that for years. On the other hand, this big crash in oil prices hurts all oil producers. Uh, and, and we are an oil producer. And finally, uh, Woody, uh, the, the, the least important thing to me uh, but still a really important thing and one that you cover uh, as well, of course, it are the markets for investors, for uh, investors, normal investors, not the, you know, uh, all day day traders. What are what are the concerns? Are you? Are you uh, urging calmness right yeah. now. Don't look at your 401k. Look, I think you should look at your 401k because, you know, but I don't think you should be finding out your login on your 401k on a day when it's down 2000 points in the Dow because you're going to make a mistake. Normal, regular people like you and me, we can't what they call time a market. The best thing for us is to buy stocks every month or every quarter like clockwork, the same amount. So when the stock market's up, you're buying stocks. And when the stock market's down, you're buying stocks. And over time, mm -hmm. stocks rise. They always do. You, 
never bet against the United States, and eventually over time you come out in the end. It's all about the time horizon. If, if, you're, if you're close to retirement and all your money's in the stock market, well, A, it shouldn't have been in the first place. Some of it should have been, but not all of it. If you need the money next week, well, you should start thinking about getting your money out of the stock market. Um, but you just need to rebalance and assess quarterly at least what your needs and wants are. If you're in a 401k, you're in your 30s or 40s or early 50s, you don't have, you, there's nothing for you to worry about here. If you're in your 20s, this is golden time for you because you can be loading up on stocks and you know that later on they're going to be worth more and that's going to be good for your, for your retirement. So it's all about the long view, dollar cost averaging. It sounds so boring, but it means routinely buying stocks and just keeping them for the long term. Christine, thank you very much for your time today and uh, appreciate it on short notice. At Christine Romans on Twitter, watch her every morning from 46 East on CNN's Early Start. Follow everything she's doing and saying, uh, including parenting advice. Good stuff. Thanks, Pete. All right, big thanks to CNN for loaning us Christine Romans. That is at Christine with an E, Romans, at Christine Romans on Twitter. Follow her, tell her that you're glad to hear her back on the show. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a longtime listener and a very generous supporter of mine on Patreon. He's a patron. I'm not going to give you his name because he wants to keep that private, and you're entitled to that if you come on the show or if you want to plug something. But just know, obviously, I mean, I think you, you would obviously trust me that I'm not making this up, that I vetted these people out. And he was actually asking, hey, I haven't heard Christine Roman, so she's on. But he is an emergency room doctor in Texas. That's all the information I want to share with you. But I called him up because... I call people up and we talk and I was asking him questions and why should my conversations always be private? He was willing to share a little bit of information to see how he is doing in the ER in Texas dealing with a pandemic. Not so bad. Yet. Here's my conversation with the good doctor. Like I said, he remains anonymous. But if you listen closely, you can hear the birds chirping. If you can identify the birds, maybe you can identify exactly where he's from in Texas. You can't. But listen, the birds will calm you down. The issue is, is. This is some kind of novel new thing that everybody is kind of scared about when the flu comes around every year. And what we don't know if this is a once through or if this is now going to be a new a new every season thing that we have to gear up for. Um, as far as my coworkers, no real panic right now. I mean, we're still working day to day and and doing what we normally do. Uh, do you guys have shortages of the things that you need? Masks, gloves, et cetera? What else would you need? Um, right now, we have not been informed of any shortages. That's what, as far as I know. Uh, do you think it's weird that I took a bath in a tub of Purell? Uh, uh, Purell, it might be a little sticky. <laughs> <laughs> How much can you know? Like, how much how much do, information do you get as an ER doctor, like, daily in terms of this or any other public health issue? Like, how, what, what does that channel look like? So, so for us, I mean, we can get – so I'm a part of the American College of Emergency Physicians, which is kind of our – our specialties AMA, like the AMA is for represents all doctors. We are part of one that represents just emergency physicians. And I'll get two to three emails a week with updates. And really just, we've kind of known what it is. We ask the travel questions. We ask the contact questions. The people that seem to get it, um, that, I mean, I haven't seen one yet. That's kind of the our thing. And none of my partners have seen one yet. But the ones that seem to be getting admitted are the ones that are pretty sick. Some people may be actually not coming and getting evaluated because it's more of like a flu-like illness and then they recover okay and then we'll never know. But with regards to that, we get a daily email from our hospital system, from our hospital system and gives us an update, but nothing more than that right now. Why do they at, at the ER, why don't they set up, I heard they were doing this in some places, like a tent somewhere outside the hospital for people who think they might need to be seen. And that goes for any kind of, I don't know, why isn't there a generally a different space for people to come into? Or is there, is that just not functional or efficient or cost effective? Or? So the way I would say it's probably not cost effective or efficient for us is we're actually building a brand new ER. Um, 
that's opening in July. And it may not be worth the cost to set up a triage area mm-hmm. like that. How, uh, but we haven't, we haven't heard anything that they're doing anything like that. For one us of the yet. things that is a big concern is that there's not enough like ICU beds. Is that something that you, a concern you share? It's a concern that I share just in general, because we don't have enough ICU beds in right general now. for the normal day to day health issues. For the normal day to day. We, we hold ICU patients in our ER sometimes hours at a time before they get a bed. How do you keep yourself and the people around you calm during a situation like this? Um, to be honest, I haven't really, we haven't really had that, that kind of health panic yet. We haven't really had that health panic, but we're starting to see the grocery stores and the Walmarts and things start to start to go into shortages. Well, I'll just call him Dr. Kind. I'll end it right there with Dr. Kind. Thank you so much, Dr. Kind, for your very generous support on Patreon, as well as your wife, longtime listeners of the show. So psyched to have you listening here on the podcast. And we are, that's it. It's over. But I do want to give a shout out to the very first five people who signed up as patrons at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. The first supporter was John M. Berge for five bucks. Chuck Morrow pays $10. Chad Slosser pays $10. Kelly Dews pays $25. James Borden also pays $5. And I'm really excited to have all of you supporting me. Those are the first five supporters on Patreon. We're almost to 400 after just about four months. So keep it up. Thank you so much for your support. As we head into a recession, I'm going to need it. So I'm going to keep bringing it for you. Three, four, five times a week, different episodes, different expert guests. Tell me who you want to hear. Email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at Pete Dominic. And if you have ideas about how to connect this community even better online for me to host a show, a discussion for us to rely upon each other and to support each other, I want to keep building this community of curious, passionate people. I'd love to know your suggestions on what I can do better. You're a producer of this show. So thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you on Friday for episode 62 of Stand Up 